can I, how can we get out from underneath this regime of employment laws that's frankly quite expensive? Um, and so they started experimenting. They said, well, there's this thing called an independent contractor in tort law that does not exist in employment law, but there's this thing called an independent contractor. What if we borrowed from tort law and we brought this into the regime of worker protections? And initially, courts said, no, we're not doing this. Um, this is not why we have a safety net. All workers deserve, um, deserve these protections. But in 1948, um, the, uh, the Taft-Hartley was passed, and one of the things that Taft-Hartley did was it amended the National Labor Relations Act, which is the law that gives us the right to collectively organize in our workplace, and it said, well, in addition to domestic workers and farm or, and agricultural workers, independent contractors are also carved out of the right to collectively bargain. And then that sort of seeped into all of the other laws. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit more because it's central to sort of what's happening right now. Um, so because the union sort of was losing its, losing its uh, reputation with the workers, because the workers didn't trust the union at this point, when the taxi cab companies in San Francisco in the 1970s said, hey, we're going to change our business model. We're not going to offer you a minimum wage anymore or do commission anymore. We're going to just let you earn all the money you want and keep it, and all you have to do is give us rent, get rent your shift. Give us, um, in 2008, the amount was $150. Give us, you know, $150, and you can have this cab, and you go out and you do whatever you want. If you want to sit on the cab all day, that's fine. If you want to pick up and hustle and make a bunch of money, then that's fine too. Um, but instead of sharing the money with you that you make, we're just going to take some up front. We're just going to lease it from you. So um, when they when they when they decided that they were going to do this with the explicit intention of turning these workers into independent contractors, the union had very little power to stop them. And workers one day were given a choice. Do you want to sign this contract and become independent and free and not have to deal with us? Or do you want to continue to be an employee? And again, these workers didn't have any sort of, I mean, they had been employees all their lives. They didn't understand or know what unregulated work looked like. So many of them were like, sure. Um, let's be independent contractors, and literally overnight, people w start were doing the exact same work, but they became independent contractors. Um, later on, the National Labor Relations Board said, well, um, you are independent contractors, and therefore you cannot have a union. So the union dissolved. So by the late 1970s, almost all independent, all taxi drivers in San Francisco were independent contractors. Um, cab companies were fascinatingly among the very first companies in the U.S. to experiment with this model, um, which makes this sort of gig, the current gig economy that much more interesting, um, that it was actually cab companies that first started using independent contractors, even before the trucking industry did. Um, so then we had the from the you know, late 1970s to the present, or to 2013, roughly, we had this well-recognized era of insecure taxi work. Um, but under the leasing system, although taxi drivers were considered employees, um, and they didn't get, I'm sorry, were considered independent contractors, and they didn't have a union, and they didn't have um, guaranteed wages, and they didn't have all the safety nets, they did have some things, and those some things were left over from the, the advocacy that the union had done in the early part of the 20th century. So um, what they had was essentially the ability to control supply and demand. So you guys drive around in LA, and it's really probably frustrating on a Friday night when there are Uber and Lyfts all over the place. Does that, do, have you experienced this? Yeah. Yes, probably. In San Francisco, it, it, the traffic has increased by, I think, I think over 50% as a result of all of the, you know, thousands of Uber and Lyfts that are converged into the city on Thursday, Friday night, and Saturday night. Well, what the taxi workers had was that they had a, a restriction on supply. Um, there, you've probably heard of the medallion system. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, the understanding that most people have the medallion system is based on what happened in New York City. It was not necessarily the case here in California. But medallions were literally just 
the right to have a cab on the street. They weren't monetized in San Francisco for many decades. They didn't have money. They weren't, they weren't commodified. They were just the right to have um, a taxi on the street. And so um, at any given time, there were 1,700 taxis on the streets of San Francisco, owned by different taxi cab companies, owned by different um, individual taxi cab owners, et cetera. And before a new medallion was issued, there was a debate on whether, about whether or not that was really necessary. What was that going to do to traffic? What was it going to do to workers' livelihoods to increase the number of taxis on the street? Because if you increase the supply of taxis, that means theoretically that everyone's wages go slightly lower, right? Um, so they had control over that, over the number of medallions. Workers also had control over how the lease fee. So even though the cab companies were charging them $150 a day, the, that number was regulated by the municipality. It was regulated by the city. So if one day the cab companies came in and said, you know what, we're going to start, start charging you $200, the, which did happen with some frequency, um, the drivers would all get together, they'd go to City Hall, and they'd speak during public comment, and they'd say, hey, we're being illegally charged $200. You regulated a hunt for $150. What's up? Tell, tell Yellow Cap to back off. And so they, um, they regulated how much money they had to pay, what their, what their rent was. Um, and then they also had some control over fares. So when you know, cities regulated taxi cab fares, and when fares went up or when fares went down, um, workers were always part of that process. So although it was, a un, uh, it was unregulated in the sense that there wasn't a union and the workers were independent contractors without all of these safety net protections, they could calibrate their income. They could sort of guess how much money they were going to make because they had some control over different aspects of the business model. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So um, the, all of those things, all of that, 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 the ability and the right to engage with regulators on those issues were the result of fights that the union had over much of the 20th century. And they were rights that the union got and that workers maintained until roughly 2013 um, when the next generation of taxi cabs entered San Francisco. I remember during this time period, um, drivers, I was, I think I, I gave birth to my first child and drivers were <laughs> coming to visit me in the hospital and they were like, there are these things on the streets, these bandit tech cabs, and we're taking pictures of them because they're operating illegally, and we're going to tell um, San Francisco uh, supervisors that this is happening, and we're going to try and get the police to get them to stop. And I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I was out of it and not really interested. And I was like, my dissertation is over. I'm going to move on. <laughs> I don't want to hear about taxi cabs anymore. Um, well, it turns out they were really onto something. So. Um, these new companies, these tech companies, enabled dr drivers to operate outside of state and municipal regulatory frameworks, and they enlisted an unrestricted number of commercially unlicensed drivers, because, you know, taxi cabs drivers have to go through FBI background checks, um, they have to get specific licenses, they have to pay for those licenses, um, and, they, and they said, look, you can download, download the centralized dispatch on your phone, and, um, and you can use your own vehicle to uh, pick up and drop off rides, and you guys remember all like how this was about the sharing economy, and you were sharing your, your car, and it wasn't really um, it wasn't it wasn't about capitalism. It was somehow about um, about like sharing what we had, and that this was going to be great in the aftermath of the Great Recession, and um, and everything was changing. So what I what I show is that these tech, these business models were actually just one step removed from the taxicab leasing business model that I discussed that was enacted in the late 1970s. So under the taxi leasing apparatus, again, the taxi cab drivers were independent contractors who were paid to work, but they drove on commercial insurance paid for by the taxi cab companies. Um, the ca taxi cab ca companies paid for the upkeep of the vehicles, they paid for the rent that I described to you, and they paid for the gas, and that's it. And in addition, again, they were laboring in a regulated industry where competition was regulated. So by contrast, these new chauffeur co corporations operated outside the context of all of these regulations, and they demanded that the workers utilize their own vehicles, bear all the associated financial and legal risks, including, for example, if drivers got into an accident. Um, 
there was a young woman, Sophia Liu, who, uh, not a woman, a child, she was a six-year-old child that was killed in San Francisco on New Year's Day by, um, by an Uber driver who, you know, was probably working 16 hours a day to, 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 um, to survive. And Uber said, oh, but he's, we're not in charge of him. He's an independent contractor. Um, and it ensued, this whole, uh, whole insurance fight ensued, ensued about whether or not Uber was responsible for the acts of, um, of the drivers who were working for them or whether these were small businessmen going around responsible for themselves. That type of thing wasn't a question in the taxi cab industry. If a taxi cab driver hit you or a member of your family, the, the taxi cab company was responsible for what had happened. So all of this is going on. There are a lot of questions about um, you know, these, what taxi cab companies called the bandit tech cabs. And by 2013, um, a lot of workers advocates had already shown that taxi cab com taxi driver income had lowered by 65%. So by in one or two years, it lowered by 65% because of the number of, of, um, of Uber and Lyfts that were on the street and at that, point, that time sidecar as well. So um, state policymakers, amidst all of this turbulence, decided that they were going to legalize the companies after issuing a cease and desist. Because again, these were companies were operating outside of any legal framework. They were operating illegally. Um, they, uh, the California Public Utilities Commission decided that they had jurisdiction and not the cities, and that's a really big deal. So what do you know about cities versus, um, versus state governments. The political science literature suggests that you know, cities are, are, are traditionally less conservative than state governments are. Also, everything that I just told you about what the taxi cab drivers could do, which is like when Yellow Cab tried to um, pull one over on them, what did they do? They just went to City Hall. They had access to the regulators. They had relationships to the regulators. Um, they couldn't, in contrast, if they, if they needed to drive up to Sacramento to speak to a bureaucrat inside a regulatory agency, uh, it would have been much, much more difficult. So it was a key, that the, it was key for the companies, Uber and Lyft, I mean, they pushed very intelligently, they pushed to not have cities regulate them. They pushed to have states regulate them. And this is true in states across the country, not just in, uh, not just in California. And so the CPUC said, okay, we're gonna create a whole new category of transportation, um, for hire vehicle, and we're gonna call these folks transportation, net, or these companies transportation network company companies. And almost overnight, all the regulations that workers had pushed for for 100 years disappeared. Um, and meanwhile, policymakers heralded the new companies for their consumer convenience and for their technological innovation. And I should note that California, the CPUC, was the first state in the, in the country to legalize these companies, calling them transportation network companies. And so the, the regulations that, um, that were passed in California ended up being emulated in states across the country and eventually across the world. So when I'm in Delhi now, I see the use of the term transportation network company, which actually came out of the, um, the CPUC's regulations. So with this, regula with, this, um, th with this legalization, early 21st century San Francisco chauffeur work rapidly began to resemble early 20th century um, pre-union San Francisco chauffeur work. And much like the taxi workers who struck in San Francisco in 1919, the TNC drivers had no set income, they paid for their own gasoline, and they drove with no regulatory limit on competition. And again, this is right after the Great Recession. This is when people are trying to get their lives back together. Um, you had a lot of really desperate um, folks who needed extra income um, and were willing to drive for whatever because they needed the extra income whether or not it was regulated. As an additional regression from taxi cab companies, the TNC drivers also had to drive their own cars, bear all the costs and wear of wear and tear, purchase gas and insurance, which is a whole nother story, pay for vehicle upkeep, all the while having their on-the-job behaviors incentivized and shaped by algorithms. So, hardly independent contractors, right? By 2015, labor unions and, um, and alt-labor groups woke up to the needs of the TNC workers. And um, as the technology-enabled contractor business model began to spread to other service industries, there was somewhat of a panic within labor. 
within the labor community. Um, in February of 2016, there was a very distinct splintering within the labor community about how to address Uber and Lyft, how to address, oh, maybe um, this is distracting, how to address Uber and Lyft and how to address um, the precarity of these workers and how to address the spread um, that people anticipated. <coughs> the spread didn't happen in the way that we sort of anticipated that it was happening. A lot of companies went out of business because it just wasn't a viable model. Um, but at that moment in 2016, there was this fear that the entire service industry, the entire service economy was become, gonna become Uberized. So what was labor gonna do about it? What were they gonna do to stop it? So some unions and, um, and worker groups thought the best route to address this, if you, were that, if you were in this position, what do you think the best route to address this is? To address these problems? Based on everything I've just told you. create a union, and you create a union if you have employee status, right? So it was to fight, well, which we'll get to in a second, but we'll, it was to fight for employee status. We're gonna sue the heck out of these companies and have the courts declare that we are employees. Others saw a more conservative and expedient route, which is to say, okay, we can't fight all this lobbying and all of these efforts, and so we are just going to um, accept what the companies tell us, that these are independent contractors, and we're gonna, establish a non-union worker association. So in San Francisco, an example of this was that there was a huge um, class action that was certified, and I should, this is such an aside, but you all should know this as, as citizens of the world. Class actions in the US right now are very difficult to get certified, and the reason that you're, it's very difficult to have a class action is because of arbitration agreements. You all have signed arbitration agreements without knowing them, knowing that you've signed them. But what an arbitration agreement is, is basically an agreement that you make as a consumer or as a worker to a company, and you say, I'm not gonna sue you in a court of law. If we have any dispute, we'll go to a private arbitrator. And so there was, for you know, many years, there was some debate, is this legal? Is it legal for us to have these to sign these contracts without even knowing it that say that we don't have any rights in a court of law and we have to have a, a private, arbitrator, or private arbitrator determine whether or not we are, um, whether, you know, who's right and who's wrong. Well, recently there was a Supreme Court decision that basically said yes, these arbitration agreements are legal, they don't violate the National Labor Relations Act. Um, and so all, you know, we're, it's gonna be hard to get class actions from here on out. We didn't know that in 2016 because that had not yet been decided. Um, but now even my kid's preschool has an arbitration agreement in the, in, the, um, in the contract. I mean, it is a very big, big thing, something that you should look at um, when, you're signing, when you're signing contracts, especially on your phone. So um, at the time, you know, we, the idea was that maybe we could fight this. We, could, we had this class action, this O'Connor v. Uber class action. And, um, and the, cl the class action, there was a proposed settlement to the class action. So many people wanted it to go to trial and wanted a decision on the merits. We want a court of law to say that these are employees under state law. And, um, and the plaintiff's attorney in Uber said, we don't want a decision like that, let's just settle the case, get lots of money and give it to the drivers. And, um, and in addition to the settlement money, they also said, well, um, Uber said, we would be willing, if you settle this case because it's such a threat to our business model, we would be willing to actually pay a union to, um, to create a worker association. Not another union of Uber drivers, but an association of Uber drivers. What is it called when a company pays a union? A company union. A company union. <laughs> Have any of you been involved in unions? <laughs> okay. Here's a question. Um, if you, you, you're much closer to, um, or some of you are probably closer to, um, to thinking of yourself as children than, than, be, than having children. If you have a sibling and you both decide that you want your parents to, I know you're older than this, so forgive, the, the, um, forgive me for this analogy, but when you were back in high school and you wanted your parents to change the, um, the time, the curfew, from eight to 10. Would it be more effective if you went to your mom or your dad and said, hey, I want you to change this to 10, or if you went with your sibling together and you said, look, 
this is we're willing to do dishes before we go, but we're gonna we want it we want to change it to ten o'clock. Which one? Probably if you went together, right? What if um, you decided that you uh, really wanted to go out until eleven? So you went to your uh, mom and you were like, "Hey, I'm gonna go out until eleven, but that guy over there." He actually didn't do his fair share of the dishes, and he has been, um, you know, smoking in the back. He didn't want me to tell you, but he's been smoking in the back. You're the company union. Like you are, you're taking, you are, um, you are sort of forming an alliance with the company, sort of selling out your brother um, to get something for yourself. But that something is a little precarious, right? Like. Who knows when your brother's going to sell you out? Or who knows when, um, wh or who knows if your mom is going to say, you, you, know, you sold out your brother, who knows if you're really going to get an 11 o'clock curfew or the, whether or not you're just going to get a 10 o'clock curfew. So company unions are actually illegal under the National Labor Relations Act. But since Uber maintains that these are independent contractors, they were like, what the hell? Well, we can use this amazing settlement to also form a company union. And there are some folks in labor that are so sort of, um, I think tainted and what's the word? They're just, they've been really disgruntled by the last 30 years of losses that they were like, we're gonna try this as an experiment. Mm -hmm. So the Teamsters Joint Council 7 in San Francisco decided that they wanted to be this company union, that they would take money from Uber and push to get portable market-based benefits and workplace voice. How many of you have heard, as opposed to a union, how many of you have heard of portable benefits in the news? So you're gonna start hearing it a lot, probably. Um, it's this term um, that's often associated with the future of work, and the idea is that you can take it with you if you go from one job to the next. Um, my response to portable benefits is, well, minimum wage is a portable benefit, social security is a portable benefit, um, so many things in our regime of employment rights are portable benefits. You take them from one place to the next. And it turns out that what companies have come up with um, and they call portable benefits are really just lower versions, less, less protective versions of what you would have if you were an employee. So this is what the Teamsters decided that they were gonna do and the judge threw out the settlement, which almost never happens. The judge said, hey, this settlement is terrible financially and the terms of the settlement are potentially illegal, potentially violate the National Labor Relations Act. He threw it out. Um, and the Teamsters quickly decided that they were no longer interested in, um, in organizing drivers, although that, that changed recently. Um, something that I should also note, I know I'm giving you like a crash course in, in, uh, in law, but something that you should, you should also know is that the reason that unions haven't jumped to get new members with Uber and Lyft drivers with all these precarious workers is because if you are an independent contractor, you're considered a small businessman. And what are two small businessmen um, together who are fixing their wages sometimes could be accused of? Anti-competition. Yeah, anti-competitive price, uh, price fixing. So per totally perversely, these low-income workers who are working together could be sued under antitrust laws for price fixing, and that's something that low-income workers would be, weather, would be able to weather because they don't have anything in their pockets to give to the corporation, but if unions are involved in this organizing, they would have to give up a lot more if they lost. So while all of this is going on sort of in the courts and behind the scenes, there are some drivers groups um, on the ground who are starting to organize. Uh, not forgetting about the unions. We're not going to wait for the unions to organize us. We are going to get together and organize ourselves. Um, in LA, this is, it was the Rideshare Drivers United, and we actually have leader organizers here from Rideshare Drivers United, Yvonne and Nicole Moore, who you've read about all over in every newspaper in the world. Um, and they, they started organizing drivers in the streets. Um, and the same thing was happening in San Francisco, this, this organization called the San Francisco Bay Area Drivers Association, or SF Bata, but it ultimately, for various reasons, um, sort of petered out. Um, but LA Drivers, uh, Rideshare Drivers United sort of built a membership, they had um, meetings, they discussed tactics, they held protests, thousands of drivers joined their ranks. I mean, if you know anything about unions, this is amazing. 
that you have these workers who were carved out of employment laws, carved out of the right to unionize, who got together themselves, precarious workers who don't even have money to pay for rent, and decided that they were going to band together to organize. Um, and they, you know, they started, they started agitating. Um, so while this was happening in 2018, this amazing thing, unexpected thing happened, which is that this decision from the California Supreme Court called Dynamics came down. Now, Dynamics was actually is a company in Hayward in the East Bay. It's an offline delivery company. They deliver for, um, like Sears, they'll deliver your dishwasher. Um, but they had done the same thing that the cab companies had done back in the 70s. They, one day, all of their workers woke up and they went from being employees to independent contractors. And so these independent contractors sued. Arbitration agreements had not yet been a thing. And so there was not an arbitration agreement in their, in their um, contract. And so they uh, were able to certify a class action. And this case went all the way to the California Supreme Court. And um, the California Supreme Court had seen a lot of misclassification litigation cases before. And they had been very frustrated by the fact that even when they found that someone was an employee, the, cap the companies would just change their business model to make it look more like the person was an independent contractor. So the, the test for employment for all of those, all of those um, that regime of laws that I showed you, there are different tests for whether someone is an employee or independent contractor for each and every law. So it's not like, like you can be an employee for wages, but an independent contractor for workers' compensation. And so most of the laws use some version of what's called the control test. The more the, the company controls you, the more likely you're an employee. But because how people think about control is so sort of ideological and subjective, decisions on the matter for each of these laws had ended up completely different, depending on who the judge was, depending on what jurisdiction you were in, et cetera. And even when the companies found were found to have employees and not independent contractors, instead of converting their drivers or their workers, they would just change their business model. So FedEx Home Delivery had this really important case in 2014 called Alexander v. FedEx. FedEx Home Delivery drivers were found to be employees under California law. And you know, like in the news, big deal. And most people actually don't even know what the outcome of this case was because it's such, everyone thinks it's like this amazing decision. But FedEx home delivery drivers were never made to be employees. They just changed their business model and actually the workers are now more precarious. They live more unstable lives than they did before. I can, I, I have a paper on that which I'm, I'm happy to share if you're interested in that. And so the California Supreme Court said, okay, we're gonna do something different this time. Instead of just tweaking the control test, we are going to, this was the original test, that you had to go through all of these things and analyze the circumstances, and then based on the totality of your analysis, a decision maker could decide whether someone is an employee or independent contractor. And the California Supreme Court said, forget it. We're throwing that thing out. Now, if we're gonna be enforcement oriented, we are losing billions of dollars, $70 billion a year to misclassified workers, or to companies who misclassify their workers. And we're gonna do an ABC test. We're gonna presume that everyone is an employee and the company has to prove, if they wanna use independent contractors, they have to prove that they, are, uh, that they are using independent contractors. And so they have to fulfill all three versions of this test. Now, key, and it's a conjunctive test, so this is A and B and C, but key is B. If the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business, then they can be considered an independent contractor. Now does Uber, do Uber drivers perform work that is outside the course of Uber's everyday business? What would you say? No. No. Uber argued that they were though, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to that in a second, right? So, um, yes, so, yes, so these good, good, good companies were freaking out. They actually tried to, in 2018, tried to introduce a law in the same um, legislative session um, it didn't go anywhere, and so for this last legislative session, I have to say we were all, everyone who was looking at this thought, well, they're gonna get what they want. These companies literally put more money into lobbying than Amazon and Walmart combined. They are going to, this is tech-friendly California, they're gonna get a carve-out from this law. 
amazingly, um, Assemblywoman woman, woman Lorena Gonzalez from San Diego decided instead of waiting The judge can um, hold you in civil contempt and can put executives in the holding cell. Like you can be in, you can be imprisoned for civil contempt. Um, so there's real enforcement and there's real teeth behind AB5, which goes into um, effect on January 1st. Um, and you know, I have to say again, I honestly did not expect AB5 to pass. It was a surprise to me that it passed, but it really surprised because it really passed because of the groundswell of grassroots worker rights groups, including Rideshare Drivers United, um, who lobbied, 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 um, and, and really talked to the media, to their legislators, and to, their, to consumers about what kind of life they were leading in unregulated, under a regime of unregulated work. So you're right, the gentleman in the back. Gig companies like Uber maintain that, that both that the law does not apply to them and, uh, and that they need an exemption from it. <laughs> so, um, on whether or not the law as written applies to them, Tony West, Uber's GC, has maintained that Uber is a platform that does any number of things. And this is, I mean, this is Facebook's argument, this is um, Google's argument, you know, they're all, they're all platforms and not like communication companies. Um, so, you know, Uber says that they're just a platform company and they actually, I don't know if you noticed this, I don't use Uber, but they changed their, um, their app soon after 85 passed so that if you want to get a scooter, you get it, or they said that they were going to, maybe they haven't done yet, that you get it within the app. If you, um, if you want to get a taxi, you get it within the app. Everything is now within the <coughs> app so that it looks like they actually do much more than just taxis. Um, Can I ask, is there yeah. were a number of exemptions, right? That was yeah. one of the complaints is that there's a lot of lobbying at the end and various parts of the economy got exempted from this, is that? So I think that that, I don't, I, I don't think that, I, it, this is also what I, I, I have heard stated, I don't think it's necessarily an accurate um, representation of what happened. There are a lot of people that are exempt from it. Most, 99% of those people were already exempt from California employment laws, particularly wage orders. So um, it's mostly professionals that are exempt, like doctors, dentists, l lawyers, um, and then there is an existing, very complicated professional exemption test um, that would exempt some people, like some freelance writers, um, some people who basically, uh, more or less captures people who are making more money um, and maybe don't need, or they have the, the ability to say, well, we don't want these wage protections. Um, and then there, there are some exemptions that, that folks got at the very end, but they were only for two years. So more or less to get to allow the industries to have time to acclimatize to this regime. So like nail salon workers got a two two year ex exemption because most nail salon workers are independent contractors and that's just how their businesses work and many of them are immigrant owned and so the idea was that we state will give you the resources to rethink your model and actually give you the resources to do cooperative cooperative cooperatives. That's one thing that um, that the state is pushing. Um, for folks who want to be exempt, if you don't want to be an employee and you don't want to be an independent contractor, you could be a co you could form a cooperative and have some of the benefits of both. Um, but yeah, so there's not as many exemptions as people would like, and people are. I think I've heard frustrations that um, from from like the, some of the trucker bro trucking brokers who are like, well, the nail salon companies got an exemption. Why do why do we not get an exemption? But really, they just got a two year. Um, time limit in which to sort of to change the business model. I wanted a, a, a exemption for taxis um, because I think one lawsuit and taxi cab companies are going to be out. Um, but I, despite my, my relationship with the assemblywoman, I did not get that. Um, so she was actually quite principled about how she, how she did her exemptions. Um, so uh, yeah, so they, they're saying that it doesn't apply to them, but just in case it does, it does apply to them, they are um, doing this ballot initiative, and uh, Ken Jacobs at the Labor Center at Berkeley did a great analysis of the ballot initiative, like overnight, literally spent like three hours, and did it overnight, um, and just show, to show us how super bad the ballot initiative is, um, drivers would get $5.64 an hour, which has not, the minimum wage has not been that low since Harry Truman. Um, so it's pretty bad. The healthcare stipend would probably not be available to something like 90% of drivers, um, there's no reimbursed expenses during wait time. Um, 
unpaid payroll taxes, so it does nothing for the California economy, and of course, no uh, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, overtime, rest breaks, or paid sick leave. Um, and they are basically relying on this idea that um, Californians, uh, California voters will buy into this flexibility argument that without uh, independent contractor status, drivers will have to work shifts and they'll lose their flexibility for a variety of reasons that I can talk about in the Q of A. That is nothing short of horse poop. Um, there, is, there is nothing about employee status by law that necessitates um, uh, lack of flexibility on the job. And in fact, these companies rely on workers who need flexible schedules. Um, and so for various reasons, I, I don't think that that is big, a big, big issue, but I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, and it looks like California voters are not buying into it. So the Emer Emerson did a big, Emerson polling did a big, um, big, uh, study over the last few weeks on a variety of Democrat democratic issues, um, and they actually polled for for this ballot initiative. And a majority of voters um, support supported AB five and would oppose the ballot initiative, um, which is good news. And um, I just want to point out um, that while we wait for regulatory enforcement of AB five. Drivers groups, and in particular the Rideshare Drivers United, which now has chapters in San Francisco, San Diego, and I think Sacramento, are no longer waiting on unions or regulators or courts to make things happen. They're taking things into their own hands. They're drawing up their own ideas for regulation, growing their membership, and proactively shaping their future on issues that range from their wages to how the data uh, they collect for the companies is being used to their on-the-job surveillance. Um, and what they're doing is really what I think um, labor did at the early part of the 20th century, um, which is they have nothing, they've been given nothing, and they are building power to take it. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. I just told you, I gave you like massive history. Um, that was a lot of information, I know, but I felt like I had to get it all in there. This one opportunity to, to get a lot in there. So if they, um, you said if they lose their initiative, yeah. um, and they 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 cannot. I mean, there's they are there already have been attempts by the trucking associations to say that AB five is illegal um, because federal law preempts state law, which is just not the case. There's the very good sound um, sound case law on this that. Um, like, for example, the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is a floor, not a, um, I'm sorry, yeah, it's a floor, not a ceiling, um, and well established for, you know, decades upon decades, but we could totally lose our democracy and that could be, <laughs> could be overturned. Um, so, no, I'm not worried about that at all, but you're right that a lot of the, the laws that I put up there were, um, were federal laws. California is unique in that we sort of take the federal laws and make them better. So while Title VII is a federal law, the you know, prohibition against anti-discrimination at, at work, we have really much better protections um, against discrimination in California. So most things that workers need and want, they get under California law. The one thing that they don't have is um, the right to collectively bargain, which is a federal law. And it's something that um, that is, a, a little, is a, somewhat of a problem because the Trump um, general counsel wrote in an advisory opinion, so it doesn't have any. It doesn't have any precedential value. It's not like law, but he said that he thinks that Uber drivers are independent contractors. Um, that sort of, I think, um, defies reason for various reasons, and that many, many of us have critiqued the um, the opinion that he wrote or the the letter that he wrote. And I think under a democratic administration, that would certainly not be the case. That if once the drivers get together and they want to file for union status. Um, that uh, you know, if Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, or whoever, you know, take your take your pick, one of them wins, then um, then you would have someone at the National Labor Relations Board who would likely find that they were employees and and allow them to have union status. Yeah. 
I have a question that relates to your earlier ethnographic work on taxi drivers. Uh huh. Um, and I know that y- you sort of or I think you um, showed that especially immigrant workers were sort of yeah. more attached to this independent uh-huh. contractor status yeah. um than employees. And so I was curious if you had seen a similar pattern. Yeah, it's such a good question. I actually just, you can look at my SSRM, I just published a paper about this, about why it has shifted. Um, there is a lot of, um, a lot of, I think, if you look at the survey evidence, most of it has been sponsored by Uber and Lyft. Um, they've you know, hired economists to do surveys about whether or not drivers want to be employees or they want to be independent contractors. And the, and the survey evidence suggests that they want to be um, they want to be independent contractors, and so every you know this is like the the big big government overreaching, and workers don't need this, and workers don't want this, and um, and so what I did was a I looked at the surveys, which were terribly written. There were double bar- barreled questions, so they were actually doing the cultural work of telling drivers that being an independent contractor meant that they couldn't have flexi- flexibility. Um, so they literally said like, if you want to be, um, if you, do you would you prefer to be an employee? Uh, with minimum minimum wage or an independent contractor with flexibility, as opposed to saying, do you want to be an employee or an independent contractor? And then the um, and then the and then when I like when I talk to drivers in this in the Uber and Lyft context about this, workers overwhelmingly um, when they say they don't want to be employees, what they're saying is that they're really worried about what kind of employer Uber would be. And because they're, you you have to look at the paper, it's like fascinating. Um, And they're really worried about losing their flexibility because so many people need and want flexibility. And so one of the things I've suggested in my work is that in uh, addition to a union, that legislators could actually um, uh, legislate for flexibility in this particular economy. And um, the gig companies put together a legislative proposal that was never introduced um, they wanted it in exchange for AB5, and they actually put out put the language in there for us. So um, they're ready and willing. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question regarding the reclassification of workers from independent contractors to employees. In this sort of situation, do you perceive a potential issue where companies may attempt to wrongfully terminate some of the people that they've had mm-hmm. as a result of these new requirements, and what sort of protections are going to potentially put in place? with uh, these new laws yeah. that may prevent that? So um, we are in at-will country. Um, so you know you can be fired, whether or not you're an employee, um, you can be, if you are an employee, you can be fired for no reason, for a good reason, for a bad reason, because I don't like Professor Tilly's green shirt, I'm gonna fire him, and it's not illegal. Um, the, really the only context in which you have just cause um, termination is in the union context and in um, public sector employment. And so um, it is possible, very possible, that part of what they will need to do, these companies will need to do, is lower the number of people on their platform, um, which is why I think a union and organizing is so important because what what a union can do or what a group of organized drivers who have the power of a union can do is to say, we don't want, and like, we do, and this is actually what happened in New York City um, through regulation, where they said we need to cap the number of vehicles, but you cannot terminate anyone because of this regulation, and um, and so from there it just becomes attrition. So drivers who 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 you know, I mean, they have crazy attrition. Um, these companies have crazy attrition, so it ended up getting the number became lower and lower by itself. Um, but it's certainly, yeah, it's certainly something to worry about. And I think the drivers' groups are really, bar- it's like very much on their um, on their radar and something that they're they're thinking about and talking about. Yeah. Has there been any like, analysis into the Uber Lyft argument that oh, these new regulations are going to be too burdensome? <laughs> they're going to sink us. You know, we're already losing money. Uh-huh. Or is that kind of the Classic company line. Yeah, yeah, like oh, I mean, it's going to be too burdensome. It is. It is the classic company line, um, and uh, I think it was. I think it was actually Truman that had it, like Roosevelt. There's this great, great quote. It's like, if a business can't pay its workers a living wage, then maybe they don't deserve being to be a business. Um, but uh, beyond beyond that that stance, um, you know, the, these companies have hemorrhaged money. 
they they are not they have not like every quarter they use they lose billions upon billions of dollars the only reason your rides are so cheap is because they're being subsidized by venture capital right so um, the companies are going to and say drivers who are depreciating and the cars that accelerate right and drive that's right they're being subsidized by the drivers and by venture capital and so the um, so <laughs> the companies will say this isn't viable um, you know your consumer prices are going to have to go up as a result of this well your consumer prices are going to go up anyway because they've been losing money and the only way they're going to make money is by raising raising prices and lowering labor standards which they have been doing precipitously since over the last four years um, the only way the taxi cab companies like there were some experiments with deregulation of the tax taxi cabs in this in the 80s um, and it just didn't work like the, the economics of it didn't work. There has to be some control over, over supply um, in order to meet sort of fluctuating demand to allow companies to stay afloat. And so I think that um, while they might argue that, ironically the way that they, that they can stay afloat is by submitting themselves to these, uh, to these regulations over, um, that have power over supply over vehicle caps. But they're, I mean, they are, they have been betting and they're sort of maniacal way on driverless cars since the very beginning, which, I mean, I don't know, I, I was always very skeptical of them, but in the last few years, I've been talking to engineers who are like, driverless cars are at least 50 years away, and then we would have to actually build our cities around them. Like, this is not like a viable solution for urban transportation. Um, so, in some ways, they're rem these companies are remaking themselves as they go. Like, they were a taxi cab company that was gonna go to you know, driverless cars by 2020, and that's, you know, we're not there yet, and so what are they gonna do next? Now Uber's doing payday loans, um, which I, like gives me the goosebumps because it is so freaky to have, um, to know exactly how much someone is making, to have control over how much someone is making, and to be able to offer them a payday loan. is so, so dystopian, um, but they're I mean, they're just they're trying to stay afloat. They're constantly remaking themselves in different ways to with all of the both the venture capital backing and like the Silicon the ideolo ideology behind Silicon Valley here. Like so much is at stake. There's so many people who really want this to work. So I can't predict what they're going to do, but um, but if they asked me, I'd have some advice for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's such a good question. Um, I, I, perhaps you should consider going to law school. It's a very good legal question. So the, um, on the one hand, whether or not the, the contract says you're an employee or an independent contractor actually has no bearing over whether or not you're an employee or an independent contractor. That's, even if you believe you're an independent contractor, even if you signed a contract that says you're an independent contractor, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's a legal determination that courts have to make. Um, on the arbitration agreement end of things, you know, intuitively, I think many of us would say, well, it's fundamentally unfair if we're go going through something on our app and we are um, we consent to an arbitration agreement. We don't know what that means. In fact, like 80% of workers in my study didn't know what an arbitration agreement was, and um, and they're not making an informed decision in sign signing this contract. Um, should we should we uphold the contract? And the decisions have been very bad. I mean, there's such a firm belief in a freedom of contract in American, lab, in American law more generally um, that courts have said it doesn't matter. They signed it. The arbitration agreement is valid, whether you're a consumer or a worker. And so, if you want to look more into these these um, this area, there are two court cases that you should look at. One is AT and T v Concepcion. It's a Supreme Court case, and the other one is Epic Systems. Can't, I don't remember what the, I was on the other side of the V with Epic Systems, but Epic Systems. Yeah. I have a question for, you mentioned 
briefly that you thought that you wanted, you argued for taxi cabs to be exempt from AB5. Uh -huh. Can you kind of like explain why that why? is? Why? Yeah. yeah. Well, because um, the taxi cab companies, in, at least in San Francisco, are not making any money anymore and they're barely staying afloat. So the thought was that if these regulations cause Uber and Lyft um, to reduce the number of vehicles on the street, that the taxi cab companies could um, could rehabilitate themselves. So I, I, was, I was arguing for a five-year exemption. They could rehabilitate themselves and maintain their, their companies, basically, and then, um, and then convert their drivers to employees. Because right now, if a disgruntled, disgruntled taxi cab driver sues any one of these companies, they're out of business. They can't defend themselves. They have no money. They'll go bankrupt. So that was, that was my thinking. I am, I know like everything about Uber and Lyft, <laughs> so ask away. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. oh, there we go. What do you think like the average like, user activity is like how? That's a great question. Do you want to answer, Ivan? Uh, yeah, so I mean. Ivan is like an organizer with Right Share Drivers United. about, um, you were talking about uh, local versus state regulation. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that's a good question. the bill being passed was at the state level. Yeah. That's where it covered everyone. And you've talked a lot about the experience of taxi drivers in San Francisco, but one of the things I've been struck by is how wildly varied uh, the agreements are from municipality to municipality for how the taxi industry is structured, what the circumstances for workers are, and around the country it varies enormously from state to state so and city yeah. to city. So that that argument you made, I'm just wondering where you're going with, with you were talking about things at the national level and the state level. Is it necessarily the case that, that such uh, drivers would be better off if this were all handled more locally? Or, I think uh, if they're independent contractors, it, it's better for them to be handled locally because they have they have the ability to then go to their regulators, um, to go to their city regulators and try and try and you know push like for a while the taxi drivers in San Francisco were pushing for health insurance um, through a consumer tax, which because they weren't getting it through the employment employment context. Um, if they're employees, um, you know. Preferably, everything happens between a the union and the companies, and so and and the regulators have some you know some input during during conflict. So, I guess I'm more ambivalent about it in the context of um, of employment status. But what I was trying to show is that with the, with independent contractors, um, it was much easier for the workers to exert pressure um, over regulators if it was the municipality making the decisions than if it was the state. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the CPC and like what is going on with them and why they haven't regulated? Yeah. Um, so the CPC, Josh, I, I, should, I can send. You, I was just writing a history about this out, and I don't have it in front of me. But the CPC was originally um, originally was invented for railroad regulation, right? And railroad regulation um, was happening because. 
the railroads had so much political power. The railroad companies had s such incredible political power. Um, they controlled mobility. They had access to politicians. I mean, this was you know as the West was being won, um, and and so the idea behind the CPUC, what was it was there was another word name for it in the um, in the late 1800s, the Railway Commission, I think. Um, the idea was to to create a an agency that was insulated from politics. And so in the California Constitution, I know, ironic. In the California Constitution, it says that if the CPUC regulates something, no other political body can have regulatory power over it. So, uh, which is why it was brilliant that Uber and Lyft went directly to the CPUC. Because then cities couldn't say, oh, you know, drivers couldn't, couldn't lobby cities to say, oh, we want fingerprint background checks in the city. And so now the question is, um, does, the legal question is, well, does AB5 give us some way to overcome that constitutional provision? Is it possible since AB5 gives um, power to city attorneys to regulate or to enforce wages that we could somehow use that to get other kinds of regulations like a vehicle cap, et cetera? I don't know what the, the answer to that legal question is, um, and it's probably going to be a political answer, not a not a you know a rule of law answer. But um, but that is what I know about the CPUC. It was when when the decisions were being made in 2015 to regulate these TNCs. I went to some of their. Um, they had like different stakeholders come together to talk about. Um, to talk about the industries and whether or not the CPC should regulate, whether or not cities should regulate, what the regulation re regulators should look like, and I can tell you with great confidence that those meetings were run by the Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. lobbyists. I mean, they got exactly what they wanted. They wrote the law, and it was, it was um, like even insurance matters, the things about around consumer safety were not. Um, did not find themselves into these regulations. And so when, like, for example, Sophia Liu died, there's a huge gap, because there's a huge insurance gap that the state just like didn't want to step in to deal with because these companies were really had their hands in everything. I mean, there's been some evidence of actual graft. Um, so there have been a couple of lobbyists who have been who have been fined. Um, but uh, but beyond that, they just they had a tremendous amount of power over the process. When I say that they ran the meetings, I mean it. They liter those lobbyists literally ran the meetings that I sat in, um, not the not the CPUC um, uh, uh, staff. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.